That's everyone saying <laughs> I have, okay? I just love the saying, if you don't have imposter syndrome, you're in the wrong room. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video from the Aspiring Medics. In this video, we play Medic Never Have I Ever with a very special guest, Fair Bait, soon to be doctor and YouTuber. Stick around to find out our thoughts on all things medical school, NHS, and more. Enjoy! So our first question, never have I ever thought that my medical school wasn't for me. Three, two, one. That's everyone saying <laughs> I have, okay. Rishma, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I think at King's we have one preclinical year and my preclinical year was during COVID so I don't remember much and sometimes when I'm looking at conditions or anything clinical I'm like wow I don't even understand my basics mm. so I've um, had to go back to my basics a lot in my second and third years and then sometimes I just feel like oh if I was at um, a university like Oxford or Cambridge where they do three years of preclinical how would that be like so yeah that, that was my explanation I guess mine's actually the opposite to Erisma so our first three years is very preclinical Oxford and I was enjoying it for the first you know two years definitely the essays and tutorials but then in the third year I was actually like you know what research potentially isn't for me and I didn't enjoy it as much and I was waiting really for that clinical contact because you don't have as much and I was just waiting to sort of be exposed to it but I did find that finally in fourth year I got that payoff because then I was talking to patients I was then in hospitals and I was able to enjoy it but in third year I think I was almost starved of that clinical contact. I would say I'm literally completely different to both yeah. of you I actually really love the curriculum of my medical school. I think it's a really nice balance between um, traditional methods, but then in terms of getting your like scientific basics, mm. but also integrating uh, early patient contact. Like I really, really, really love that. I thought early patient contact helped keep me motivated. Mm. Um, mine is more the outside of the curriculum, um, more of, yeah, I just think it's really important to find a university um, or medical school that you think suits you as a person and your own personal goals yep. beyond just the curriculum. Mm. So our next question, never have I ever had imposter syndrome? Three, two, one. Faye, do you want to start <laughs> off with this one? Um, God, I, I just love the saying, if you're not, if you don't have imposter syndrome, you're in the wrong room. Mm. I think having imposter syndrome is a, a sign that you have something to be proud of. Um, and it's a very normal emotion yeah, yeah, yeah. to go through. I think as long as you can recognize it as mm. imposter syndrome and, you know, tackle that um, without letting it deter you and get to you and stop you from achieving your goals, then I don't, yeah, then I think, that's, that's something normal that we do all go through. Yeah, agreed. I do think it's very normal to have, especially like from sick form where you might be top of your class, you know, if you went to medical school, for example, and all of a sudden you go to medical school and everyone else was top of their class, then you're like, oh no. You sort of think, okay, what's your identity then, you know, with academia and everything else? But I think if you bear in mind that actually loads of people are feeling exactly the same and therefore in the same boat as you, that can actually be quite reassuring. And if you tell the people and they think, oh, actually, you know what, I'm feeling quite similar, that in itself can be quite reassuring. Yeah, I agree. I think my journey was a bit different in the sense that I was quite good top of my class in school and then I came to university and it was supposed to be hard, but it was during COVID. And so everything was online, my exams were online. I didn't even know how good or bad I was, so I just carried on. And then in second year, I happened to do well as well. And then third year came along and I think that was the first time that I've properly felt imposter syndrome. It was just so many deadlines and so much studying and everyone around me achieving such great things and I just felt like, I don't know if I'm meant to be here, but I think it is important that you recognize it and that you make an effort to you know, realize that you wouldn't be here if you didn't deserve it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you wouldn't get into medical school if they didn't think that you were worthy of this place. I truly do believe that you can manage all of this. So I think that's really important to recognize and then realize that um, so that you sort of push those feelings aside. Yeah, because there's too many hoops in the process for like medicine, for medical school, right? You've got so much that they look at, past statement, entry exams, interviews. So they've got all of this because they're trying to find the right candidates. So if you've been chosen, you know, you should have confidence in that. So you should be quite reassured by that. Okay, so the next question is, never have I ever spent 50 pounds on question banks? Three, two, one. Oh, you haven't? I haven't. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I feel like you need yeah. to start. Okay, so I have like obviously used it, but the reason being that my medical school pays for it, like my college actually pays for it, which is really, really lucky. That so is they've insane. paid for my past med access, so yeah. 
yeah, I don't have that. So I've spent m lots of money on my question banks. And I think I was just using one before, but then I had this big exam come up and I was like, I need to diversify my types of questions. So then I was doing fast med and quiz med mm. and bite med actually. So oh. I've just been using You shopped stuff. around. <laughs> No, I, I think with PassMed, I love PassMed, I'm, I'm a big PassMed fan, however, I think with PassMed, after you've done enough PassMed questions, you can read the first sentence and you know the answer. I think they really follow a pattern, and I was the same, I actually came to the conclusion last year, it's really important to use different question yeah. banks so that you're not just relying on pattern recognition, you're actually testing your knowledge. And the other thing is, obviously, you can use Anki as well and create your own flashcards from lecture notes as well, and that can be quite useful. Anki's really popular here at Oxford or Cambridge. The next question is, never have I ever felt like medicine wasn't for me. Okay, three, two, one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is very getting very predictable. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to go for this one? Yeah, I think, um, for me, I think, there's a lot of stuff that's already discussed about, you know, the life of doctors in this mm. country that that's been spoken about. I think what I wasn't expecting was probably the more traditional values um, that are quite prominent, I would say, in medicine and just trying to find where I fitted into that as maybe someone who didn't necessarily fit that, that mould. And I found that quite difficult, I think, finding people you can... I don't know, align with and mm. relate to yeah, yeah. is really important in any career, but especially in something as emotionally taxing as medicine. And yeah, I struggled with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, and it's very common to feel that. And I think, you know, whenever you're going through like a tough moment on placement or whatever, it's very common to, you know, question, am I doing this for the right reasons? So I think that in itself is quite normal. Do I want to leave medicine? No, I think it's absolutely great, right? It's the emotional satisfaction, the variety that you're able to get. But I think feeling like, at points, questioning whether you've made the right decision is completely normal. I think now in the midst of junior doctor strikes, there's a statistic that like 60% of all junior doctors have actively researched leaving the NHS, for example. So I think it is very common for people to feel. Yeah, I think my reason is kind of different, but similar at the same time. But for me, I think I've never been satisfied just doing one thing. So I think even if I picked another you know, path in my life, I still wouldn't have been satisfied with just one thing. I always want to be doing multiple things. And sometimes I wonder if medicine is too sort of time consuming for me to pursue my other interests on the side. Also, in addition to that, you know, junior doctor strikes, looking at the state of like doctors working conditions at the moment, of course, I keep thinking, did I make the right decision? I could have done something like computer science and just, you know, work from home and this and that. But I think I just want to be able to do multiple things at yeah. the same time. And I don't know how much medicine allows that. I would also add, I think the fact that you consider whether it is actually for you is very, very, very important. And if you haven't considered whether it's actually for you, that is more concerning because yeah, I think yeah. you you shouldn't go into something like medicine blindly. Yeah. And just considering it doesn't mean that it's not for you. It just means that you're looking at it with a much more clearer perspective than yeah. just going into it for the money or the honor yeah. or anything like that, which just really will wear off in the long run. Yeah, exactly. We've actually got a whole playlist on motivation that you can have a look at. We've got a video on docs leaving the NHS. We've also got online work experience course that so if you guys are aspiring medics thinking about going into medicine it's really really useful it's completely free that you can also check out so yeah link is in the description below. So moving on from the next question never have I ever actively researched leaving medicine. Three two one you haven't. I haven't. Oh. I actually haven't. Um, again, I think for the reason I just I really do enjoy it. Like I do love the idea of being a doctor within the NHS. You know, I think is there a lot that can be improved by the existing system? Hell yeah, absolutely. But overall, I do love it. Like any placements in the sense of camaraderie that you get with all the different healthcare professionals, I wouldn't want to do any other career really. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> Maybe you've motivated me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm actually really surprised that you said it was on. It was 60% of junior mm. doctors as research leaving. I really would have thought it was higher. <laughs> but I think again, like, there's nothing wrong with researching like other options yeah. I, and I actually think from my personal journey with considering leaving even like medical school and you know potentially not working as a doctor in the future it actually strengthened my determination to finish my degree and mm. to become a doctor because it really realigned like why I, I want to do it yeah. um yeah yeah I completely agree I have actively researched leaving medicine the conclusion that I came to is that I don't want to leave medicine. Um, I probably want to do things on the side along with it, but I don't think I would ever completely quit medicine. I absolutely love medical school. I love what I study. 
it's more about the actual job that uh, I sometimes question and I actively research jobs like consulting which I think are getting increasingly popular amongst medical students mm -hmm. and I was like you know this is quite similar to medicine it's a lot of problem solving but just sort of in a different way but actually going through that I was like oh but I still love medicine like I love problem solving but I love it in a hospital I love it in a clinical setting and that just strengthened my love for medicine so I'm sure that I will do extra things in the future along with medicine but I don't think I would ever completely quit. Exactly it's not mutually exclusive you can combine things together right so whether it be research, leadership, management, consulting, entrepreneurship, health tech like whatever it's like being a kid in a candy store there's so many different flavors of stuff that you can do it's just about how you want to combine that and just because it might not be the typical sort of specialty or pathway doesn't mean you can't do it. And as a bonus question, what degree would you guys do if it wasn't for medicine? I actually know my answer for, for this because it was a very like tough decision yeah. for me. I really, like, I was very, 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 very split between applying to like drama school or medical school. That was the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they were like my two, two passions and uh -huh. just obviously not very much linked but then I guess I in a, some way I feel like I kind of get to live out that dream on YouTube a little yeah, yeah. bit. <laughs> I think mine would probably be like business management I would say I think just being able to think creatively and being able to manage a business or an entrepreneurship endeavor I really really enjoy especially when it comes down to like small scale startups there's a lot of flexibility there's a lot of autonomy and there's a lot that you can get involved with. Yeah, sort of similar to that, um, I biology has been my favourite subject since um, like the seventh grade, so I was quite set on this for a long time. But um, in my last two years of high school, I studied economics and I got very interested in that. So I think I would have picked economics, business, something similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question, never have I ever thought that different medical specialties have different personalities. Yeah. <laughs> okay. God, we're not being very interesting. No. We've all got the same lady <laughs> answer, haven't yeah. we? Okay, so I think my answer is, yeah, I think, I don't know, not to overgeneralise, but I do think it's generally true. And I think surgeons just in their roles tend to be a bit more focused and a bit more direct on what the issue is. Um, and I think all of that also is also related to time, right? Whereas GPs can have a lot more time and that means that they can have more time whether to watch and wait potentially when need be or actually have a better understanding of you know, what's going on psychosocially with the patient as well and see actually, you know what, is there a, um, a low mood aspect that's contributing to someone's chronic back pain or whatever it might be. So I feel like different specialties, because they have different times that they can spend with patients, therefore mean that they can have different approaches to patients. It's funny because it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, 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 like yeah. are people a certain personality drawn to different specialties yeah. or is does that specialty, the culture of that specialty create people with yeah. these personalities? Yeah. And I, I think it's a little bit of both because yeah. I think there's definitely some things that specialties that align with my personality traits and some that don't. Yeah. But also like if you're surrounded by people who are a certain way, you're going to end up like that. That's true, yeah. that's true. And I think interestingly, I was having this conversation a couple of days ago, I think the most common like medical stereotype is that surgeons are just super egoistic. Yeah. But, you know, in some ways you need that because without that ego, you know, you're cutting into someone. You're going to mm -hmm. cut open a body. Like you need to have a certain level of like ego or like ridiculously high self-confidence to be able to cut open someone. And it's like, you know, these these personality traits aren't necessarily a bad thing. I feel like they are portrayed as bad for surgeons quite often. Not that I want to become a surgeon, but I, I just think it's needed sometimes. Like your personality traits make you a better doctor for the specialty that you choose. Mm. Yeah, and I think, you know, the same way that um, we, we just filmed our video about ADHD, yeah. and I know a lot, of, um, a, a lot of people tend to associate like ADHD with um, going down the emergency um, route. And I think that, a lot of traits of ADHD really do lend themselves to like the high intensity, fast paced, um, adrenaline filled. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it, it, it's it's looking at your strengths and like really honing in on them and finding a specialty um, that really utilizes your strengths. Yeah. At that same time, though, I have met so many like orthopedic surgeons that actually take a really, really holistic approach and look at you know everything when it comes down to patients. So obviously, it does depend. But by and by, if I had to guess. 70% of the time I could be guessed a specialty, probably. So the next question is, never have I ever stuck to the specialty that I thought I was going to do before medical school? Three, two, one. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, I can go first. I think mm-hmm. before medical school, I um, was quite passionate about women's health and obs and gynae. I still am. I just think medical school has given me the opportunity to like other specialties as well. And more recently, I think my priorities in life have changed and I really value work-life balance and being able to have like a nine to five and go home, get a good night's rest. And I don't know if obs and gynae is going to give me that. Um, so I've just opened up my mind really. Yeah. I think before medical school, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to do this. And like, I know, and all of these doctors are telling you that, no, you, 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 you're like wrong. Like you're not going to make your mind up now. And I was like, no, I know better than you, but that's so right. I was basically the same. Yeah. I was obs and gynae till I die. Mm-hmm. Like that was my yeah. passion. Mm-hmm. And then I did my obs and gynae placement. And honestly, the, the obs and gynae doctors were the most, seemed to me the most unhappy doctors that I'd ever met. Like they just seemed so unhappy and tired and like, bitter that was the first the first placement where I had like um I had several of the consultants that I was with turned around and said to me in the middle of the clinic and almost word for word the exact same thing saying there's still time for you to leave and this was in my third year and I thought oh my god that is the such a red flag for me and, and I was the same I think I, I thought that I don't want that to be me yeah um, yeah, yeah. I think I was really considering anaesthetics. I really liked the idea of like science of pain. I even did that for my third year project, really enjoyed that. But I think when you learn about something in knowledge, that can be quite different to what it's like in practice. And actually something like A&E or GP, probably at the moment is what I'm more steering towards. But again, obviously, I think it is about keeping an open mind. You don't need to choose your specialty. And also, you don't have that experience here until you've yeah. you know got, gone and done medical school and done your FY1, FY2, then you can really make a decision. The worst thing you can do is close yourself off. Yeah, exactly. It's no point. Because you don't, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Okay, our next question. Never have I ever fainted in surgery. Oh, wow. Oh, yay. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. You've got a good story, though. Yeah, so one of my friends, I won't name who, um, actually fainted one time when watching a C-section, and they were actually helping, like, retracting the abdomen. And then they were going to fall forwards, and they were literally fainting forwards, like, into the abdomen during the C-section. And the registrar literally had to like break the sterile field and catch them. Um, so yeah, some people do faint. I've got someone else who like um, is a friend of mine that faints and they still want to be a surgeon. But again, you can sort of be desensitised to it. So yeah, if you do faint, don't worry about it. You can definitely get yourself over that hurdle. <laughs> I just love whenever you're a med student who walks into theatre, they always go, there's the chair, yeah. just let me know if you're not feeling yeah. okay. Yeah. And I just think, oh my God, please tell me the story behind why you're so keen to let yeah, me know yeah. the chair is there. <laughs> so yeah, don't be afraid to sit on the chair if you need it. Never have I ever watched Grey's Anatomy. Three, two, one. I haven't. You haven't? Oh. I actually haven't. I haven't watched House or Grey's Anatomy. Am I missing much? I didn't do House, but, yeah. and I only started watching Grey's Anatomy in my first year, mm-hmm. whereas I think a lot of people, their like med school motivation, yeah. they'll say that it's to help people really, they mean that they, <laughs> they watch Grey's Anatomy, but uh, you know, no, I love Grey's. Fair. I just started watching Grey's two weeks ago. Oh my God. So I, I'm already on season three, yeah. uh, but I definitely enjoy Grey's for the drama. Like, I mean, I couldn't imagine watching Grey's before medical school and thinking, yeah, I want to go to medical school. Like, I, I just don't imagine that, but I'm quite big on medical drama so i've watched chicago med good amsterdam oh, new amsterdam uh-huh. um yeah i watch like loads of them uh, and they're, they're so good i think the newer ones have a lot more like medical focus mm-hmm. um so i love chicago med i love new amsterdam mm. but yeah i would i would recommend medical drama i watch more like actual like document you know like uh, 24 hours in a and e like the ones with the nhs or i used to watch embarrassing bodies as a kid but who hasn't? Who hasn't? <laughs> oh, when you're a kid, you're like, and it's all the rude things. Like, yeah. Woo! Oh, 24 hours in a is such yeah. like a touchy one for me because basically when I like flopped my A-levels and um, didn't do very well and had to reset, I couldn't watch 24 hours. Like I used to really enjoy yeah. it. And then when I was going through that period, I like could not watch it because it was like so painful because I felt like, oh, I'm never gonna get into medicine. And it, uh, no, it was really sad. Like I just couldn't watch it. And then yeah. in my second year, like I put it back on again and I was like, oh, like I forgot how much I loved it. And like, now I can watch it again because I'm in medicine. But yeah, yeah. yeah. That's such a sweet story. Like the ending was yeah. so sweet. Yeah. Thanks. It had a happy ending. (laughs) We have one more bonus question. So we've been talking a lot about, you know, leaving medicine and all of that. But if you had to think of your best experience in medical school so far, what would it be? 
I think mine is probably in Ops and Gynae. I had a really, really nice midwife who like took me under her wing and she, like she taught me like how to help deliver a baby and that was magical. So I was literally there right at the start in the morning and then right to the end, like literally when giving birth and I was like the first one to hold this baby, like holding this new life. And the baby just looked at me with its eyes and it started crying. And I was like, right there, you go off to mum. But like that was such a cool and magical moment. That I was like, wow. It honestly just had me just starstruck. I was like, wow, this is so cool. I really think that everyone, I don't know what your one's going to be, but I think if you ask a lot of medical students, they're going to say, oh, an obstinate guy, you may yeah. but mine was assisting a C-section on my birthday. Mm. I was like, oh my God, you have the same birthday as me. <laughs> and it was the first C-section, because I, I, it was my first block and my, my birthday's first of September. Mm. So it was my first block back and it was like my second day or something. So it was my first time assisting with mm. a C-section. Yeah. Mm. And I like, I just was looking at this, like at first time assistant, I was like, yeah. oh my God, this is the coolest thing, but you're just ripping someone's uterus and then just like whisk this baby, baby off, like same yeah, thing. Yeah. And I was just looking at this baby like, oh my God, we're like twins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, so I haven't had a proper obs and gynae placement so far, so I'm only in third year and we have a proper obs and gynae placement in fourth year, but my experience is also from Obs and um, We had like a couple of weeks here and there in our second year and this was my first ever time on like clinical placement. It was my second or third time I would say. And you know, when you start off placement, you usually feel like a burden and you know you don't need to be there. You're not adding any value. You feel like a burden asking questions, this and that. Um, and I was in the maternal assessment unit, which is kind of like a &E for pregnant people. Mm -hmm. So they come in with like, probably, um, you know, whatever issues that they have and there's no like appointment booking system or anything like that. And there was this woman who came in and she was very clearly, she was South Asian. Um, and she came in crying and she was so, so sad. As soon as she came in, she burst into tears and she handed her kid over to the doctor mm. and I think the baby was maybe two weeks old so quite new and basically she came in because she had like an infection on her c-section scar um and she was struggling to speak in English and it, clearly she was just so distressed and in my mind I was like you know I know that she probably speaks the same language as me like should I help should I not keep in mind this was like my third day on clinical placement and then I was like you know what I'm just gonna do it I'm just gonna ask her if she speaks the same language as me and then I did and she felt so you know comfortable and she could like explain her issues so much better and she just felt so happy at the end of it and I felt so happy because I'm like oh, wow I'm you know for the first time I felt like I've actually made a difference yeah, yeah, yeah. and I helped someone and then when the doctor was examining her she even let me carry her baby um, and I was just like oh my god this is perfect and she even asked at the end of it she was like are you gonna be there next week like please be there next week and I was like okay I'll come back for you <laughs> uh, but I think yeah that was my best moment definitely Especially when you're a medical student, and like what you said, yeah. you are like very useful, useless a lot of the time. Like if you see any medics on social media, like placement, oh, with my stethoscope around me, just know that about half an hour later when they're actually on placement, they feel like an absolute waste of space. Yeah. Um, and I think what gets you through is like those moments. Yeah, moments. So, yeah. oh, that's so horrible. <laughs> Okay guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check out our Phage channel as well. Link is in the description below. And if you want us to do more collaborations, let us know down in the comments below. All right guys, see you in the next one. Bye bye.